so good evening, everyone. Um, this is probably going to be the last time for those of you who have been with us already for a while that you will hear me say this and introduce myself. My name is Anthony uh, Porcelli, and I go by Tony, and I am the Assistant Dean for Hofstra University School of Health Professions and Human Services. Uh, it is my absolute delight to be welcoming you to this evening's State of Hope event. Our event tonight is a part of both a signature event series that is titled The State of Hope, which stands for Healthcare Opportunities and Policy Exchange. And this particular version of our event series is being offered as a part of our National Public Health Week um, event series as well. Hofstra's National Public Health Week event have been taking place and will be taking place throughout the month of April as we have adapted and changed our medium of offering events to an online format in light of COVID-19 concerns. Tonight's event uh, is something that the Honorable Kemp Hannon and I have been working on for the past several weeks as well as ha have our esteemed panelists whom Kemp um, or Senator Hannon will be <clears throat> we'll be introducing shortly. Uh, the format of this evening's event is going to follow a series of welcoming remarks and introductions, beginning with myself. I will then be introducing the Dean of our school. Um, afterward, Honorable Kemp Hannon will take over the formal proceedings for tonight's event, and we'll be introducing our speakers, our panelists, um, and facilitating questions throughout uh, the evening. The way in which we're going to be going about receiving questions is through the chat function within the Zoom video conferencing session that we are in. If you could please, as you have questions, access the chat function. It's at the bottom of your screen. As you move your cursor, you should see a toolbar appear at the bottom where you can type in your question. Um, at, at this time, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Holly Syra, um, who is the Dean of the School of Health Professions and Human Services. Dr. Syra has been at Hofstra University for over 35 years and has held a variety of leadership positions. Uh, to name a few, Dr. Syra has served as the Executive Dean of Students, the Vice President for Campus Life, uh, most recently, she became uh, a full professor in the Department of Counseling and Mental Health Professions. She has served as the Vice Dean for the School of Health Professions and Human Services, and most recently as the Dean. Uh, during Dr. Syrup's tenure as Dean for the School of Health Professions and Human Services, our enrollment and programs offered have uh, grown exponentially and uh, we have been able to make a presence in the local and regional communities in a way that did not exist prior. Dr. Syrup's leadership has been recognized on numerous occasions. Most recently, she was named one of the top 50 women in business by the Long Island Business News as of October 2019. It's now my pleasure to ask Dr. Syrup to please offer some words of welcome. Thank you, Tony, and thank you for that, that warm introduction. And special thanks to Tony and Kemp for really organizing this event and keeping it on task. We're so excited that we're able to offer this in the virtual way that we will be this evening. So good evening, everyone. Uh, whether you are sitting in your living room, at your kitchen table, or in your own office for this program, we welcome you to our virtual community at Hofstra University. I have a little picture here behind me of Hofstra to get you feeling like you're on campus. Uh, and thank you all so much for joining us as we celebrate National Public Health Week and specifically at our third program in our State of Hope series. As Tony mentioned, the State of Hope Healthcare Opportunities and Policy Exchange was created to provide an outlet for the community to come together to discuss contemporary issues impacting healthcare and the related policies. Tonight, we're going to be exploring closing the gap on health emergencies, and there's never been a more important time to address this issue. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted our physical and mental health, changed how we go about our daily lives, and challenged our communities and healthcare infrastructure. But it has also brought about a renewed appreciation for the heroes in our health, healthcare workforce, and we applaud
applaud each of them. It's also brought about innovation and collaboration between public and private sectors, including government agencies, healthcare, academia, and manufacturing. We've all been called upon to do our part to meet the goal of defeating the virus. And together we will get through this and we will be stronger and a more empathetic community. I'd like to thank our panelists of experts who Kemp is going to introduce specifically for so generously giving your time to share your experience, your knowledge, and your insight on the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. To begin the program, it's my honor to introduce our moderator, the Honorable Kemp Hannon, Health Policy Fellow in the School of Health Professions and Human Services. Kemp joined HPHS in April 2019 after a distinguished career in the New York State Senate, where he had a reputation for working across the party lines to put the health and well-being of others in the forefront. Kemp's career in public service mirrors our school's mission to create a more health equitable world for all by educating future leaders to work in clinical, policy, research, and advocacy in healthcare settings. His facilitation of this evening's event will allow for an exchange of thought, policy, and practice, leading to recommendations and a call to action. It is now my pleasure to turn over the floor, or in this case, the screen, to Ken Panic. Thank you, Dean Sarah. <clears throat> and you get the award for the best background ever for doing <laughs> this webcast. Um, is that just a picture or is that real tools? The um, idea for tonight is something of the continuation of what I used to do in the Senate Chair of Health uh, Committee, which was develop public policy. When we started out as a topic for the forum that would be part of HOSFA's Public Health Week, it was a totally different topic. As the virus began to dominate our society, it was obvious this is what we had to address. But each week over the past three or four weeks, what we've decided to talk about has had to change as the nature of this virus, the nature of the reaction of the healthcare system has had to change. And so what we are at tonight, and we'll go through some slides borrowing the break from Governor Cuomo's presentation today, um, what we're at tonight is a bit of a change as to where we're going. And while people are very anxious to come out of this isolation, come out of social distancing, we see just today, the governor has said, no, I'm gonna require people in the public to wear masks because we're not out of it. Um, in fact, we've seen a little bit, while there's downturn in many of the statistics, yesterday, Mayor de Blasio said there was an uptick. Um, and the, the latest statistics are pretty sobering. Uh, this afternoon, the county of Nassau saw its number of cases go up to 26,715 and deaths increased to 1,057. Out in Suffolk, we see that there are 23,523 cases, which is an increase of 832 in one day. And the number of deaths in Suffolk is now 653, which is 45 just from yesterday. So those are particularly sobering numbers in terms of public health and tragedies to the families involved. Um, so where, where are we going as a state? Um, where, let's just take a look at um, the statistics that the governor put out today uh, and which will lead us to start to talk about where do we go from here? Where do we go from here first in regard to health? And then where do we go from here in regard to public health? And then third, where do we go from here in terms of how do we as a society operate? Uh, Tony, could you bring, just bring the first slide up, which shows the number of hospitalizations, and it has a little bit tailed off, uh, but it is definitely, well, no, the first slide, I'm sorry. This is the total number of, well, there we go, hospitalizations. It, you can see the curve, we're plateauing. This was the apex that we we're at, but after the apex, we didn't know if it would diminish sharply, whether it would stay the same, or whether it would be a long, long gradual uh, tailing. And uh, as the point has been made by the governor, it depends on what type of isolation we continue to do. So as part of the other parts of the statistics would be, next slide, the total hospitalizations have gone down, that's the net. That means that, and we'll see in the 
subsequent slides, there are people still significant numbers going to hospital, but we are also discharging. And um, in, in that, it's not only uh, uh, good because it takes pressure off of the system, but it also means there are some people who might participate in the plasma studies to see what type of the immunization can be brought. Um, these are the net, net change. You can see it definitely tailing off uh, the pressure. Uh, the difficulty is, and uh, Dr. Moskowitz can go into it, what, uh, what the nature of the, the pervasive nature of COVID is in his hospital at the moment, um, is we have also expanded the number of beds in hospitals almost by double. And some of those beds are not necessarily permanent situations. Next. Here we go, the serious cases tending to go down because intubations would be those people who need the oxygen pumped into their lungs uh, or assisted being pumped into their lungs. And uh, the very, very serious cases, as the governor points out, two thirds of these um, don't often make it. So once again, continue to go on from there. This is the tragedy. We, while we have, quote, plateaued, we still see too many deaths and uh, we're just not sure what's gonna happen. It's also obvious that that statistic at the bottom, about 45 from nursing homes, may be uh, 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 unfortunately growing far too much. Uh, a population with many, many comor comorbidities, uh, a population that once it spreads in a nursing home, uh, it's hard to stop. And uh, the statistics on the nursing homes are just now getting developed. I think there was a suspicion by those in the media there was something fishy going on, but frankly, there, were, there was not a, um, a lot of reporting mechanisms for this to be done, and there was not a lot of uh, reports to be made. So that's all changing, and I think in the next couple of days, we'll see some unfortunate news come out. And here, um, the focus, we can see that there is a difference because of those in the minorities, Hispanics and Blacks, uh, disproportionate to the part of the population. And uh, to those who are males, uh, we can see far disproportionate to your part participation in the population. And then we can also see the statistics for those who are over 50, over 60. So it's um, it, it, it's, it's a difficult, and these are the statistics that are right now on the, uh, the state's website. Um, we have more, do we have more slides? Yes. So this is jumping way ahead where we wanna go, because at this point, I wanted to turn to folks who have real experience in the field of public health, in the field of health, in the field of making policy in all. Uh, and the first one would be Professor Anthony Santella, who's at Associate Professor of Public Health at Hofstra. Um, he's a graduate of Connecticut, of uh, uh, um, Emory, and then a Doctor of Public Health from Tulane University. He's re aside from incredible writing and incredible insight when he gives his classes, he is new claim to fame as he's been doing webcasts. I don't know if it's daily or every other day, um, aimed, aimed at the children at home, um, aimed at relieving the parents who are newly homeschooled. And so um, this is this is his uh, his new uh, claim to fame. Probably a term that no one he didn't see it was coming, but I've heard from people they really appreciate it. Turning the, the okay. floor over to you, Anthony. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, this is definitely not the spring uh, sabbatical semester I envisioned, but here we are, and I'm happy to be with everyone today. Um, I'm going to share some thoughts I had about the public health response to the novel coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, you can advance the slide, Tony. So just by way of background, because I know we have a, a large and mixed audience here tonight, let me just say a few words about what is public health. Public health is the art and science of preventing disease, prolonging life, 
and improving quality of life amongst communities or populations using organized efforts. And as you can see from the word, word cloud on the upper left, we use a whole host of methods and strategies and models and theories from really the A to Z of uh, disciplines. And we do our work largely focusing on the things that impact our overall health that can be changed. And as you can see from the bottom left, that includes largely our health behaviors, which make up 30% of our overall health, and the socioeconomic factors, which are 40%, the things that we're seeing played out, and I'll, I'll note in a few moments, about jobs and education and transportation, those social determinants of health. I'll also mention a few words in a moment about equity-oriented solutions. Oftentimes, uh, people use the terms equality and equity, equity um, interchangeably, but they mean different things. So equality is promoting fairness, um, and that only works if everyone needs the same thing, versus equity ensures that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to get what they need to be successful. And then last but not least, you know, while um, public, I've never heard public health mentioned so many times as I have over the last month or so, you know, these things that, these control measures, these non-pharmaceutical interventions that I'll, I'll mention in a, in a few minutes are things that are not new in our profession. They've been happening for thousands of years. And while we're now focusing on one of the 10 greatest achievements of public health, which is infectious disease control, you know, this might be new for the general public to hear and understand, but we have an entire workforce that's been dedicated to providing equity-oriented solutions. Next slide, please. So I just want to take a few, a few moments and talk about how some of the past pandemics and current pandemics have influenced our way of thinking about COVID-19. If you go back to the plague, which um, began in Central Asia in the 1300s, um, uh, killed between, you know, 100 and 200 million uh, individuals, um, recurred later on in the 14th and 17th centuries. We learned the, the importance of quarantine. Quarantine works. These ships that were traveling back um, from war or and other kinds of travel, people had to be quarantined. They had to stay in their ships for 40 days. We know that prevented disease transmission. If you look at the flu of 1918, which I know a lot of people refer to as the Spanish flu, although its origins most likely were not in Spain, were actually probably in Asia or Europe, um, uh, killed 50 to 100 million people, which was, you know, 5% of the world's population, and over a half a billion people infected. And this was largely spread um, through crowded military camps and dense urban populations. And, you know, a lot has changed in the 100 years since then, but, you know, people really had poor nutrition and poor sanitation practices that further spread this disease. And it ended with widespread immunization, which we know will be one of the critical factors to getting us to um, the light at the end of the tunnel with COVID-19. HIV AIDS, which is currently a, a pandemic, it hasn't gone away from that status, unfortunately. In the U.S. alone, we have over 40,000 new cases each year, 17,500 deaths. There are over, you know, 35 million people living with HIV AIDS around the world. We learned the importance of testing people. In fact, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force has graded the HIV test an A grade and would like everyone over the age of 18 to know their HIV status. Knowing your status can impact your timely receipt of care and treatment, which makes a big you know, difference when it comes to health outcomes. And we also learned the importance of at grassroots advocacy and holding our legislators accountable for ensuring that public health and pandemic preparedness is not something we consider just in these moments of crisis. And then last but not least, uh, most recent pandemic, um, H1N1, which was from April 2009 to April 2010, over 61 million cases, 12,500 deaths, our federal government acted quickly, the FDA to release new tests, the CDC to release medications from the national strategic stockpile. Certain school districts were closed based on um, uh, cases. So the federal government acted quickly, and there's a lot to be said once we have time to reflect on our, our current situation. Next slide, please. So 
So what has been the public health response? Well, you know, I know these, uh, the things you see bulleted here are, are things that are now kind of, you know, being talked about everyone and they're not, um, necessarily as novel as one would think. But testing, testing, isolating, and contact tracing are key, and I'll talk about that um, again in a few moments. But not only testing for active infection, um, and thankfully we now have rapid diagnostics that can use just finger prick or saliva to test for active infection, which you know also happens with other illnesses like HIV and hepatitis C. We're also now, you know, uh, especially with essential and healthcare workers looking to do antibody testing, those proteins that are made up once someone has fought an infection. Isolation, you know, separating sick people to avoid the spread of illness. Quarantine, restricting the movement of people who are well or simply to monitor their symptoms so that you can diagnose people early. Contact tracing, something that, again, is something kind of a household term right now. This is something we've been doing for thousands of years to control diseases, particularly, you know, the fileable diseases, things like tuberculosis, STDs, vaccine preventable diseases like measles. And this is basically if someone has a known disease, looking back to see who they've been had encounters with so that you can advise those people that they may have been exposed, they should get tested. But we have nowhere near the capacity, the fi financial resources, the human resources to do this. The CDC director said just this week that they would be adding 100,000 people to do contact tracing. That's, that's a drop in the bucket, considering what we really need to do contact tracing for everyone who has infection. Physical distancing, you know, everyone knows, keep six feet away. This, you know, the, the bench scientists really aren't 100% sure how far this, the droplets can really travel. This could be just a guidance. The banning of public gatherings, which I know especially this time of year when we have um, religious holidays is difficult. The closing of businesses and schools. And finally, you know, face masks. I know a lot of people have a lot to say about face masks, but not only does this, you know, um, provide people an opportunity to have some level of protection, I'll leave my, let my clinical colleagues who are speaking after me maybe uh, talk a little bit about this, um, but it also prevents us and I'm, I've been very self-conscious not to do this while the camera's on me, of touching our face. You know, the average person touches their face, you know, 10 to 20 times an hour. And we know that having uh, the virus on our hands and rubbing our eyes, scratching our nose, biting our fingernails, that's an, an opportune time. So the public health response, while it may seem like a big toolbox and things that are new to the public, these are things that we've been doing for thousands of years. Next slide, please. So, you know, uh, Senator Hannon mentioned earlier um, the racial and ethnic disparities that have, um, have we, that we've been talking about, rightfully so, for the last several weeks. COVID shines a light on unacceptable health disparities. And unfortunately, this will become a disparity disease. And we know that particularly racial and ethnic minorities like African-American Black individuals or Hispanic people and other minority groups live sicker and die younger, predominantly because of those lack of social determinants of health, like lack of access to healthcare and food and unstable housing. And they're also more likely to have those underlying medical conditions that make that are risk factors for COVID, like heart disease, diabetes, and asthma. And so we're seeing an exacerbation of this of these health disparities. And uh, lastly, you know, when it comes to the workforce, if you're thinking about who are those essential workers who are working the grocery store, the warehouses, the delivery, we have to see disproportionately um, racial and ethnic minorities and people who are being more exposed to the disease outside of the healthcare workforce. And so in times of crisis like we're in right now, we tend to see the best in people and the worst in people. And I want to talk for a moment about that if you can advance the slide. There have been numerous acts of you know, xenophobia and racism. Outbreaks like this um, uh, deliver fear, anxiety, and panic. And that's a key ingredient for xenophobia and racism, particularly amongst marginalized groups. And you know, these kinds of outbreaks um, are associated with the othering of people, right? And we think about people who have Chinese background, Asian background, even healthcare workers who are being exposed to this. We're seeing microaggression, violence, social avoidance, denial of healthcare. 
Um, and these acts of discrimination not only are coming from within the community, they're also coming from our government officials sometimes. You know, you know, it's probably not news to most people that we've had our, you know, president call this the China virus. That does nothing good for anyone. And in fact, will hinder things like advances with foreign policy and trade and those kinds of things that are critical to the success of our economy. We have to remember that our public health response is rooted in social justice, inclusion, and solidarity. Next slide, please. So what does our future look like, our future public health response? You know, if you, besides these kind of, uh, the key federal task force people like Tony Fauci and Deborah Birx and the, the uh, Surgeon General, the former CDC director, Tom Frieden, has provided a lot of really great insight. I would encourage you to follow his work. And, you know, he said there's a long war ahead and our code re response must adapt. Testing, isolating, finding people, and then quarantining and self-isolating those people who um, who um, have been exposed. But this future will look a little different. If you go to the last slide, please. What's our new normal going to be, or what should it be? You know, until there's a vaccine, how we go about our day-to-day -day life is going to look a little different. You know, we need to think about partnering with tech and entrepreneurs so that things like contact tracing, those 100,000 people that the CDC director said we need can be expedited and more efficiently and effectively through using technology. We need to further advance these rapid tests, not only for testing for the infection, but also for the antibodies. And then being prepared to be inconvenienced. So whether that means the physical distancing staying in place, having your temperature checked before you go you know, to restaurants, we have to be prepared to accept these control measures for the interim period before there's a vaccine in order to keep the public healthy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. That was sober, a sobering look, and uh, I do back up your, um, your call to heed Tom Frieden, who was an extraordinary director of health for the city of New York, um, and who I had immense amount of interaction with as we went through any number of different problems with HIV and Hep C and tuberculosis, um, things that didn't make the headlines, but always pointed out to me the need for public health. We'd like to now turn to Dr. Josh Moskowitz, who's an emergency physician and associate director of operations at a Jacoby Medical uh, Center. Uh, who has some very sobering um, stories to tell, and uh, uh, he is he, great at speaking because he had been a professor at, at Hofstra for a number of years, and uh, the actual practice, I think, is, has lured him away. Dr. Moskowitz? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I apologize if I mute the phone a few times. Um, there's a lot of overhead announcements in the hospital, and it can be very loud, so I'll try to minimize you that distraction as they go off. Um, so I'm an emergency physician at Jacoby. I, I run the operations of the emergency department here. My background is both public health, disaster preparedness, and, and business management as well, and trying to keep the operations afloat. And so it's been very challenging here on the front lines trying to figure out what's the best way to, uh, to battle this novel problem. You know, this is a, a new disease that we know nothing about, that we've never encountered before. Uh, it's invisible, you can't see it, and we have no clue how it really spreads. It's a very, very uh, new terrain for us. Um, with all the conversations you hear around PP as an example, you know, what is the best way to protect oneself? What is the actual way it's spread? How long does it sit in the air? These are all questions that make it very challenging for us. You know, when did this disease even first show up, first of all? You know, we've all talked about these patients now that had these vague symptoms, these bilateral double pneumonias that didn't quite make sense, it didn't quite go away from a few months ago. Was that early COVID cases that we didn't know about yet that were starting to pop up? You know, I think uh, Anthony kind of mentioned, what is the asymptomatic rate? You know, how many people have carrier states where we don't know? And that's why testing is so important to really identify what the actual population is carrying and who's exposed. Um, who's vulnerable? We have some ideas on the vulnerability, um, elderly age being more vulnerable than younger age. Comorbidities, diabetes, blood pressure, asthma, et cetera, being more vulnerable than people who are healthy. But we also know this disease is very cruel and targets anyone from a young, healthy 26-year-old to an elderly person who's bed bound in a nursing home. And it really doesn't determine who wants to kill, it just does, and it's very, very challenging. So what's the challenge for us? Um, it, it's several fold. You know, we started off this problem treating it as if it was like a Ebola in a way. 
know, we've all trained for Ebola because it was a known disease. We knew how to put the PPE on. 30 people attacked one patient at once and contained it and really kind of structured it. And it became very clear very quickly this was the opposite. This was 30 patients per provider and was very, very overwhelming and very, very difficult to manage as a result. Um, the vagueness of the infection uh, modality was also very hard. You know, what is the proper PPE? Is it N95? Is it these power air respirators that we're supposed to wear? Is it goggles? Is it face shields? And, you know, there's still a lot of discussions happening on that. In controlled environments like an ICU, it's a lot easier to manage. Patients are stagnant. They're, they're stationary. They stay in one room. In an emergency department that's already crowded to begin with, and now more patients are coming in and they're moving all over, it's, it's very challenging. And working for a city hospital where you have to utilize every square space available to take care of people is even more challenging. Mm -hmm. you know, we have to have patients, unfortunately, in, in hallway spaces just to manage the volumes. And so these kind of uh, things make it more, more difficult to manage. So what do we know? We noticed that uh, early on our volume surged. You know, for average day, we see 180, 200 patients in the emergency department a day. We were seeing upwards of 220, 240 patients a day in the emergency department. And so that was a real big challenge for us here at Jacoby. Um, one of the things we did early on to try to conquer this was try to set up a forward treatment area, a way to limit the amount of infections in the emergency department. And I give a few pictures to Porcelli to share with us today. So we set up some tents outside the emergency department, which a lot of other EDs did as well. Um, Porcelli, if you want to put up one of the pictures, you can go ahead. Um, so essentially, we had the Office of Emergency Management help us by getting these tents, and we utilized them as an opportunity to, to care for people in a forward area. You can skip to the, the big picture one first that shows the, the two tents as the approach to ED is probably the best one to start with. There you go. So this is a, a shot of our ED. Um, this ramp is normally accessible by, by car traffic. So if people are being dropped off by a private car or walking up from the bus stop, they walk up this ramp. And so we utilize this opportunity to, to station a, a greeter, a, a provider, whether a nurse or, or a physician assistant, out front. Um, sometimes rain, sometimes cold weather they'd be outside and they would approach every patient walking in and making a decision and immediately, is this patient sick and needs to go into the emergency department immediately or do we have a moment to assess this patient? And if they didn't look critically ill and they were here for a COVID-like complaint, which essentially was anything, they were brought into the tent. They came in because they fell and they broke their leg. It was most likely not COVID initially. We allowed them to go into the ED for the traditional process of triage and intake. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is just an uh, overview of the tent I uh, tried to capture. It's heated, it's air conditioned, it's lighting. And if you go to the next slide, you can see in, or go to the first one, I guess, you can see what the inside of the tent looks like. We have care providers, nurses, physicians, and PAs all lined up throughout the tent to go through. I believe if you go to the fourth slide, I can show you my, um, our structure. So this is essentially the structure. They hit a greeter nurse or physician assistant who did the assessment and decided right into the ED immediately or to the tent. Um, if they went to the tent, the first tent had a clerk who opened the visit and a PCA who started vitals immediately. They passed in the second tent where they hit a mid-level, whether it's a, uh, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant, or a resident, and then eventually they hit the attending. And so what we did was, because our volumes were crazy high, we were seeing at one point upwards of 75 patients a day in the tent. 75 patients a day in the tent. Um, we were using providers from all over the hospital to help us. We were in crunch mode. And so we put out a call for help, and, and the hospital was very great to us. They gave us you know, some pediatric residents. We got some dental surgeons who came in. We had nurse practitioners from various ambulatory clinics. And so their expertise is not really emergency medicine. So we utilized one attending physician from the emergency department to oversee the whole process to make sure we had no errors and we had safety checks to kind of catch that. We found overall that patients were uh, being discharged home 90% of the time. If you hop to the next slide, it just kind of shows the layout inside the tent itself, um, which is pretty much what we discussed here. And we have the ability to scale up. So right now our volume is much lower. We're down to one lane of traffic. But at one point we had three lanes of traffic open to process people. And each patient we process in under 15 to 20 minutes to determine whether this person was safe to send home or not safe to send home and needs to be admitted to the hospital. We found that if people were brought into the emergency department, 90% um, were being admitted to the hospital once they got screened out. So this was a very effective way for us to realize who was sick enough to need to be seen right away. And this is what kind of translates to the, the weirdness of this disease is the lack of treatment options, right? All we really have in our pocket we know about is oxygen. Um, X-rays always look crummy. They always look like there's double pneumonia. And they don't always correlate with the level of disease. The best tool we have really is a pulse ox, sometimes the heart rate, 
and not really fever. Um, we were seeing temperatures in the 99 ranges, and people were really sick. People would walk up this hill to the tent, they exert themselves, they use a lot of energy, and they sit down, they look fine. You put the pulse ox probe on them, and wouldn't you know what the pulse ox is 80%, 70%, when normal is supposed to be close to 100. So it's pretty scary stuff. Pre-COVID, we saw a number like that. We'd be rushing them into the resuscitation bay, working them up, everyone jumping on them. And here these guys are walking up the hills and look fine. And so we were using that as a big screen tool to determine who was sick enough and really needed more aggressive therapy. Um, it was really helpful for us because it kept a lot of the infectious people out of the emergency department. To bring one infectious person in requires so much cleaning, so much intensity, so much traffic, it's really allowed us to control the environment. Anyone working in the tent was in full PPE, fully protected. We were very strict. You couldn't walk in the tent unless you were fully gowned up. We were monitoring the whole time. So our, our, our level of awareness and security and heightened awareness was very, very high to really maintain the best possible environment. So this was very helpful for us. Um, the next part for us now is the volume in the emergency department has dropped precipitously. So we were seeing, I said, on a normal day, 200 patients a day. Now we're seeing probably 100 patients a day. The question we have is, where did all the other patients go? Where did the appendicitis go? Where did the diverticulitis go? Where did the belly pain go? Where did the heart attack go? And we have no clue. Because every other ED, every other emergency department has the same problem that we're having. And so we're really concerned what's going to happen as COVID goes away. All these people are home with their problems getting sicker and nobody knows and just trying to stay home. Or what happened? We do know COVID is really weird. In the early phases, we started testing everyone who was being admitted. We were very aggressive early on here. I think that was very helpful for us. You came in because you passed out and broke your ankle. We're going to admit you for ankle surgery. Well, guess what? Your COVID test was positive. We saw so many of those, these vague symptoms. Oh, I have a little diarrhea. Your COVID test was positive when you got admitted. It was very odd. And so we think that this was much more prolific than anyone who realized up front. And we think that people may be carriers and not as sick, but we're only seeing the really, really sick ones in the emergency department. And we're seeing the ones that are really ill, critically, and unfortunately a lot of them are, are dying when we see them at that level. We have no clue what the actual rate in the, in the, in the public is. So those are some of our challenges. Our biggest thing is, what is the predictor of mortality? What can we use as a screen tool? Is it the pulse oximetry? Is it the heart rate? Is it risk factors? And we don't have good data still to understand that. Uh, we might not find out until much later what the best data is for that. So that's really what we're looking at as we speak right now. Um, the next part for us is really hard, is trying to figure out where to store all these patients, where to admit them to. We ran out of space. The surge capacity of New York is not great. The surge capacity is how much Extra capacity can you build above your baseline on a moment's notice? And that's what Cuomo mentioned a lot. At most, most hospitals in this state are running at 90-something-percent capacity. 90-something um, percent capacity on a normal day. So to go from 100 people in a hospital, for example, to 200 people in a hospital is incredibly difficult. So we have to build a lot of non-traditional spaces. If you're on LinkedIn, you're on social media, I'm sure you saw all these health systems talking about, we built a space in the lobby, we built a space in the atrium, we built a space in et cetera, just trying to manifest. So in our ED, we built a space in the waiting room, as an example. If you go to the next slide, I have a map of our emergency department somewhere. It's not the cleanest map, but you can see all these little rooms in there. You see a big open area up in the kind of front on the top left as you walk in. If you walk in on the top left corner and you make a left as you walk in, you walk to the right of this page here, you have a huge waiting room. We actually built a wall in that waiting room and shelled off an area and put 15 beds in there put 15 admitted patients who are boarding or waiting for a bed of stairs to kind of be in an area outside the main ED to decompress. At one point, our emergency department you could probably hold comfortably 60 to 70 patients. You can operate 100, it's not pretty, but at one point we were boarding 75 to 85 patients, meaning 75 to 85 patients were admitted to the hospital waiting for a bed to go upstairs. And that's really, really hard. So by using this waiting area, we're able to decant a lot of that to at least give us some breathing room, some space to, to move around. You know, we had to double up people in rooms, which is not ideal, but we had no choice. We, pediatric volume is way down as well. Kids are just not getting sick with this for some reason, which is great news for them. So we ended up taking up a bunch of the pediatric ED. And that's not on this map here. We ended up putting 20-something patients in the PZD waiting for a bed. So we're able to get our admitted volume down to open up our space to allow us to take care of the critically ill patients still coming in. Um, and the challenges are you go to this waiting area space. Well, guess what? There's no oxygen tanks there. 
So it's a non-traditional space. There's windows outside, the lights don't turn on. These are not traditional spaces, so we have to be clever and, and, and flexible to, to manipulate this. You know, bring oxygen tanks in, they only last so long, so you couldn't put people who need high levels of oxygen, but while the lower levels are too sick to go home, but not sick enough to need high levels of oxygen. And so this was very helpful in our decompression. You know, PP was a big concern in the beginning. Um, when we first started this problem, the public panicked, right? We normally had tons of PP. They were disappearing off our shelves faster than you can imagine. You know, it was really, really going fast. And so we had to put a lockdown on it. And it wasn't ideal, but we set up in the command center a check-in, much like you would check in for any other opportunity. You had to show up and say, this is what I need. And you had to prove who you were and why you were there. Um, so you couldn't just come shopping in the ER. And while it was cumbersome and it took a little while to get your gear, it fixed our problem immediately. So people couldn't disappear with gear. I mean, I remember the first day we had this problem, like 10 boxes of masks disappeared overnight because people were grabbing stuff. You know, we ran out of wipes in the beginning. And so this really helped us protect ourselves. The ideal environment is you walk in, you put your mask on, you put your gown on, you put your hat on, you throw it all off as soon as you walk out of the room. It doesn't quite work for this so much. When I have to go room to room on 30 patients, I don't know if I can throw it out each time I go out. I don't have 30 gallons to throw out every hour. It's, it's crazy. Um, and that's where some of the problems kind of went through. Excuse me, my light turned off. I've been sitting for too long. One second, please. And so, you know, that's part of the problem that happened here. You know, if we had an ideal environment, we all have these purified air respirators that power air into your face. But A, those are expensive. And B, do I have 100 for my emergency environment? Absolutely not. That's not practical. And that's part of the challenges we face. And so really fighting through this. And the last piece I would say for us is a moral issue, the morality issue, the morale, excuse me. Our staff is really struggling. You know, we, we got a lot of help, which was great. We had nurses and physician assistants and physicians come from all over to really help us out. But they've learned a strange system, a strange environment, getting in the computer system, how you get into the pharmacy medication dispensing machine. These are all a lot of steps that take a lot of coordinated uh, outlets. And so really trying to mitigate and manage this was extremely challenging, but also very rewarding to see the differences you made. Um, a lot of our staff are having a hard time with this level of sickness. Like I said, morale's a little low. Um, and it was challenging. You know, people are, are, are dying, and it's, it's really, really tragic. You know, we're kind of out of that danger zone in the beginning. We were really scarce on ventilators. We were really tight. It's much more loose now, which is great, so we are not as concerned. But, you know, it, it's really hard. What do you do when somebody comes in and they're critically ill and they're bed bound at baseline and they don't talk at baseline, they don't eat at baseline, you know, and they need a ventilator, and I have three left in the hospital to choose from, and I have a 26-year-old who has no health problems. This is part of the, the hardship that the staff was feeling, trying to like navigate these difficult waters that have never been before. We're used to just giving everyone everything, and so it's really, really not easy. And um, I would say part of the, the, the challenges that we face here today. there any questions I can go further let's, let's encourage people to use the chat function and uh, submit questions as we go along we'll come after we finish <clears throat> hearing from dr. Moline we will um, have a bit of a discussion and then try to answer as many questions as possible uh, not going away uh, I would like now to uh, turn the, the, the microphone so to speak over to dr. Jacqueline Moline who is an, an epidemiologist, uh, most appropriate as you're talking, Dr. Moskowitz, about what's happening to all the other uh, ailments that are uh, endemic in regard to society. Uh, Dr. Moline is a doctor from, um, from, from Yale, from the University of Chicago, and uh, is now a professor at the Northwell School of Medicine, um, and uh, continues to maintain her uh, private practice, and uh, in regard to the title of her uh, professorship is incredible. Occupational medicine, epidemiology, prevention, and internal medicine. Um, I don't know where you get the time to breathe, doctor, but now maybe you could just give a little bit of insight as to where we're going. Thank you so much. So um, I actually am the chair of the Department of Occupational Medicine, Epidemiology, and Prevention, and while I am not a true epidemiologist, meaning I don't have a PhD in epidemiology, 
I am a occupational and environmental medicine physician, but I do epidemiologic research and work with some wonderful epidemiologists in my department. And um, I have to say that this pandemic has made it much easier for my department name to be understood because now people don't say, what is epidemiology anymore? So um, I think for many of you on the uh, watching today, you probably knew that what epidemiology was already, but um, for the lay public, they've all heard this terminology now. You know, I um, trying to think of, there's so much to cover in terms of what we could do. And, and I thought as I was sitting here hearing the wonderful presentations from Dr. Santella about the public health response and what public health is, and Dr. Moskowitz talking about what it was like in the front lines of how do you manage these patients. What I wanted to do is step back and think a little bit um, in my area, which is looking at population health from an occupational medicine standpoint. And again, here's another term that all, everyone is now talking about, which is no one used to know because it was really based in my field, which is PPE, personal protective equipment. I used to have to describe what that was and now I don't anymore. Um, and I think, you know, there has been some of the challenges that the healthcare system has had has been we have infrastructure in place. Like all of us have a, um, every year, every healthcare worker who has patients has to get fit tested and has an N95 mask. Um, and the reason that we were uh, usually given this is to prevent us from communicable diseases such as tuberculosis. And that's where a lot of the screenings came from and we have our annual tuberculosis screening. So hospital workers were familiar with that before, but then there became the additional need for additional protective equipment and what exactly do we need? And what are the challenges and what is the appropriate PPE? And you heard about what's called the PAPR, which is the purified air powered respirator that Dr. Moskowitz talked about, which has always been there and it's used in industry. We're in a very dusty environment and it can provide full protection and actually some of the best protection there is, but they're very expensive, they're bulky and, they're, and most healthcare systems don't have a lot of them. But what is the appropriate PPE? And there's been a lot of debate. And we're even having this debate now with Cuomo's, Governor Cuomo's um, edict today that everyone has to wear a cloth mask in public. So you'll have some folks who are experts in personal protective equipment really against the idea of a cloth mask because they say it doesn't protect. And in fact, if they look at the actual protection from a cloth mask, it doesn't give much. What it might do is prevent some of the spread outward, but it doesn't protect inward. On the other hand, it doesn't allow you to touch your face, so for that, it's got tremendous value. Um, so there was the challenges of what's the appropriate protective equipment. Is it a regular mask? Is it an N95? Is it other types of masks when there weren't? What do you do when you don't have enough? Uh, Dr. Moskowitz talked about early on there was enough and then there wasn't. And there's, I think probably all of you saw the picture of the nurses wearing the hefty bag because they no longer had the protective gown. I mean, that's just criminal that there were not enough resources available for the healthcare workers to appropriately protect themselves. And they had to MacGyver their way through um, what they needed. Um, what are the OSHA standards? OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is having its 50th, or is it, uh, yes, is it, uh, it's the 50th anniversary this year of OSHA um, from the OSHA Act from 1970. And um, they could step in and do an interim rule about COVID-19. They haven't done that. So the government's response has been conflicting. The CDC guidance has been, um, I would say, adaptive rather than proactive in terms of protecting healthcare workers. 
and their advice to the public. Uh, at one point when there were mask shortages, they were advising healthcare workers to use a bandana if there was nothing else, which provides no, no protection in terms of what folks need in a hospital, particularly when they have um, to do procedures where there's a lot of risk of um, exposure to the viral particles. How do you decontaminate the personal protective equipment? Can you even do that safely? NIH just today came out with different ways that, that some of the N95 masks can, can safely be disinfected that have been it's shown to be effective in these shortages. But the real question is, why do we even have these shortages? And these are real policy questions that I think will be vetted out and talked about for the next 20 years or 30 years of public health classes in terms of how do we better prepare in our pandemic preparedness. Um, one of the, the seminal events in my career was 9-11, and um, I was one of the um, worked with a tremendous group of folks, and we developed the World Trade Center Medical Program. And we knew early on that there wasn't protective equipment then that was available for the rescue and recovery workers. And so we're seeing something that happened in 2001 repeating itself in 2020, where there isn't adequate personal protective equipment, although for very different reasons and different groups of people. Um, with respect to that. I think um, not to go over some of what has been discussed today, but what does the response need to look like if we're looking at it from an epidemiologic standpoint? Do we have an adequate understanding of the magnitude of the exposure and the risk? We know from testing, and there's been testing done of women who are about to have a baby because there's concern for both the women as they're about to have their child and also to the healthcare workers and also potentially to their newborn, um, there's been testing that's been done at various health systems of women the day before they have a baby. And these are folks that you would expect have been quarantining or doing their appropriate social distancing as they're about to deliver. And the rates of asymptomatic um, positive testing has been around 11 to percent in the different numbers I've seen from different health systems. So we know that at least that percentage of folks are truly positive and they don't even realize it. And what are the implications for asymptomatic spread in terms of the population? So we need to have an understanding of the magnitude. We keep hearing how there's been so much testing per capita, it's less than 1% of the U.S. population. We don't have a handle on it. And when you have estimates of between 25 and 50% of people may have had it or been exposed or be at risk, those are just, that's a very large number to have such a wide confidence interval around. Um, who is going to be at risk going forward as we begin to think about reopening to decreasing the social distancing? Is the antibody testing, what does it actually mean? And they're trying to validate the antibody testing. Um, does that confer immunity and for how long? Does it last for a year? Does it last for two years? Some of the knowledge that we have from previous coronaviruses, whether it's SARS or MERS or other coronaviruses that cause more of a common cold like, it appears that it doesn't prevent us, it may mitigate a second illness that may not prevent it. So perhaps those people who have had it, um, if they do get infected a second time, if there's another wave, it won't be as severe. But can those people go back? Can they be the first people to go back? And what does that mean if you did the appropriate thing and you sheltered in place and you didn't go out and so you didn't get the virus and you didn't get exposed and you really want to go back to work? Um, now, you can't go back to work because you never had the virus, but someone who had the virus and who's recovered is allowed to go back to work. So what does that, what are the implications of that from a societal standpoint? How do you protect those at risk, or talked a little bit about the, the PPE and the social distancing, we need a vaccine. We need to think about workforce safety. And, and we were talking about some of the social determinants of health and how it appears, it, it's 
apparent that the rates of disease among um, African American and, and Latinos is higher than the percentage in the population, than their respective percentages in the population. And part of it may be that many of them are in the jobs that are essential functions. So they have more exposure and more opportunity to be interacting with the public and are um, at greater risk from greater exposure and greater opportunities for exposure. Um, there's been a lot of about the food delivery folks or the delivery folks and the, the various struggles at different companies um, where folk don't have the adequate protection. What kind of protection do we need to put in place there? Just recently, there's been, the food supply has been um, affected with some of the largest meatpacking um, uh, facilities in the country having huge outbreaks that are requiring their closing. Uh, the downstream implications are people are worried, what is that going to mean for the food supply? But, but when you go from having 100 cases to 500 cases in three days, because the workers are elbow to elbow in a meat processing facility and they're not wearing protective equipment because it wasn't deemed necessary, um, then we're doing something wrong. We know we're in the midst of something. If we can't social distance, we need to make sure people are adequately protected. We need to, from a medical standpoint, we can identify those who are at greatest risk. If when you're doing things that aerosolize the virus, whether it's having to intubate somebody or put them on the ventilator, whether you're doing a ear, nose, and throat procedure or a dental procedure, things that are intuitively are going to put you at greatest risk for nasal or oral secretion or breathing or other respiratory tests. Um, we know how to protect better for that in medicine. We need to make sure that that continues. Um, how do we set up monitoring going forward? How do we monitor what needs to be done going forward? And there's one other group of folks that we haven't addressed, and this is novel. This is a novel virus. But what are the long-term implications for someone who has had coronavirus or had COVID-19 in terms of their overall health. When is their pulmonary function going to return to normal? Will it return to normal? What kind of services are they going to need? How do we ensure that there's adequate home care and oxygen and pulmonary rehab, things that are in general in limited supply going forward in an otherwise um, healthier group of folks that wouldn't have been expecting to need many of these services and how long will that last? Um, I think it, um, there have been some interesting changes in healthcare that have arisen. I think um, probably Dr. Moskowitz doesn't see it because he's on the front lines of doing everything immediately when they get to the uh, emergency room and trying to assess and evaluate. But once someone gets to the floor, there's the, because there's, uh, there's been the shortage of PPE and a shortage of personnel. There are fewer tests being done. That is a good thing for the patient. We probably, we definitely over test when people are in the hospital. And I think there's been some pushback. Do we really need this test done every day? Can we do something every three days? Can we monitor it safely to protect the healthcare workers? And in the long run, it becomes better for the patient. Telemedicine has taken off. So many folks are going to their doctors and having a tele, telemedicine visit um, and that are finding it's convenient. And for many things, they can get their questions answered or can have some type of assessment that's being done. And I think there will be some long lasting changes as a result of this. I think that one of the things that we need to, to think about um, as we're going forward, and I'll just close on this, is some of the, the lessons that we learn um, from the World Trade Center programs that are still ongoing is the immediate concerns about physical and mental health um, gave way to long-lasting physical and mental health problems. And it wasn't just those who were directly affected, but it was so many more folks were affected in the um, community at large. And there were early studies of 
rates of depression and anxiety in all of New York, even if people had no direct connection to the World Trade Center. Everyone in this country has had a connection to COVID-19. Their life has been disrupted. They are doing a virtual class instead of sitting in a room with a bunch of people talking with them. Um, their kids are at home. They're, they don't have a job right now. They're, if they do, they're being asked to do more or they have fewer hours. Um, and the social distancing and the isolation and what are the impacts and what are the long-term implications as we reopen and what are those scars going to be like for so many people. Um, and I think those are some of the things we're going to need to think about as we move forward. And I'll stop there and I think it's uh, covered a whole swath of things that we could talk about this for hours, but it's important to get your questions. I was originally going to think we should have a discussion among the panelists. However, your presentations have been so thought provoking and raised so many different questions themselves. I think we should just continue on to our panelists who have uh, an incredible array of questions. And I have lots more in case they, uh, you get through those. But let me, uh, the first couple of questions could be addressed by Dr. Moskowitz. One says, what are some of the innovations that are coming about in the ER uh, that will they become part of established protocols uh, going forward? And then someone asked a really technical question about the relationship between the viral load and the severity of the disease. So I don't know if you can handle both of those at once, Dr. Moskowitz, but. Yeah, I mean, they're really good questions. And some of the answers is I don't know. Um, you know, testing is still a huge problem despite what people are talking about. You know, testing is still not as widespread available as we necessarily need it to be. You know, we're only testing patients in the emergency department that are currently being admitted. We're not testing patients that are going home because we don't have the capacity for it still. We're still struggling to reach that capacity. And results aren't necessarily coming back as fast as we'd like. Um, they're not coming back in an hour like people want to come back. It's coming back sometimes in several days. Furthermore, we don't know how accurate the tests are. Some sites tell me their accuracy is only 60%. Some tell me it's 70, some say 80. Those are very, very big differences. So the most important thing is, what does it matter? And that's my question to you, right? So we think you have the disease, your symptoms fit the bill. My treatment is pretty nonspecific, it's oxygen, and you know, just trying to get your breathing better. Having a negative test doesn't mean anything to me, right? I have a guy I transferred from another hospital, an old colleague of mine who's very, very ill, and his test was negative. I don't care what his test said. I looked at his x-ray, I looked at his labs. He had the disease. And sure enough, a later test eventually turned positive. But, but the point is, these tests aren't as important as we're holding them to be until A, more accurate, and B, so widely available we can test everybody. You know, what does the future hold? Does the future hold that one day we're going to test every healthcare worker when they show up at work to see if they're positive or not send them home? I don't know. And when are we going to get to that level? Does it mean you're infectious and you test positive? One would presume so because you're testing for the presence of the virus. I think the antibody test is much more important to say who's actually immune, who's actually protected, and what's your risk of reinfection. But the is question there about- a, Is there a one size fits all in the way you treat somebody, or is there actually two phases to somebody who has a severe case of, of COVID virus? It's pretty much one size with escalation, right? You start off with the minimal amount of support they need and then escalate up. So maybe you just need a nasal cannula, thing to stick in your nose with a little low flow oxygen. That's great. One of our biggest, biggest successes, and people start to think it's crazy, is proning the patient, making them lay on their stomach or on their chest while they sleep. And some reason that position allows the lungs to inflate more, allows the alveoli to pop open more, and really dramatically improves the oxygen level. I, I watch patients, heart rate start at 135 and drop down to 100. The oxygen levels start in the 80s and go right up to the high 90s just by flipping them onto their stomachs. Huge difference. So the question about the viral load, we're not measuring the amount of virus right now. We're just measuring presence or absence. And even then, our sensitivity is questionable at this point. So one would assume, yes, higher viral loads are more disease, but I can't say definitively so. Dr. Santella, um, maybe you could just address the point with um, what mitigation and suppression strategies are out there and how can these strategies work, especially in our low-income population? Yeah, so I think, you know, just by 
uh, way of background, if, in case people aren't familiar with that term, community uh, mitigation are those non-pharmaceutical interventions that are so critical right now in the absence of a specific COVID treatment or a vaccine. So what can you do to ensure community health and well-being in this time we're in? And that's complicated because the science is still evolving. And so you have to think about the epidemiology, you know, how many of these outbreaks are going to happen? What's happening in the surrounding areas outside of the jurisdiction you're even concerned about? That's why you hear Governor Cuomo keep on talking about, you know, you can't do one thing in downstate New York without considering the other, you know, Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester, Rockland, the city. You also have to look at the community. You know, are there, uh, is community engagement something that's been happening? Are there, is there a good relationship between the, the community members and the local officials and the healthcare system? Is the healthcare workforce ready and ready to take on these surges? You know, is there, is there the actual workforce? Do they have the, you know, hospital capacity, the ICU capacity? And then last but not least, is the public health capacity, which I don't think is going to be surprising to anyone who's on this session with us, that it's simply not lacking. You can't underfund and undervalue something as critical as public health for years and years and years, and then expect in a moment of crisis to dump millions of dollars and expect it to just work like that. That just doesn't make sense. But yet that's what we're expecting of the public health workforce and the public health system. Just in Nassau County alone, this is, and this is no criticism of our county health department, they're working 24 hours a day, seven days a week on this, but we have a small county health department. There's no way they could take on the capacity of implementing things like the community-wide testing or the antibody testing or, you know, these kind of field testing sites. We need resources from the federal uh, and state government to aid that. And that's why I hope when we have time to kind of sit and reflect on all this, that we do things not only differently, but better. And maybe that means, you know, uh, more use of technology and other kinds of things that can um, account for the lack of workforce we have in, in public health. Because, you know, like I said, you can't just make something out of nothing, but community mitigation will be the key to kind of once um, we're at the other side of this curve or this apex in kind of maintaining community health until there's a vaccine. So, you know, do I think everyone's going to get an antibody test in Nassau County or Long Island? No, of course not. Do I think there's possibility to do things perhaps like using research and evaluation to get a better sense of who's been infected, who's been exposed, who's immune, whatever that means, because we still don't really know what that means. Yes, but how can you even propose those kinds of things that are so important to advancing the science when people are dying or then there's people on TV saying they don't have the PPE and there are more pressing issues um, than the niceties right now. So, um, but community mitigation is um, important. I'll leave it at that. I think we're going to have a whole subsequent forum on what public health should look like as we go forward. I know for years it's always been underfunded. And even when there have been breakthroughs, at one point we had um, allowed a partner, someone's partner had a, a sexual transmitted disease. We allowed a drug to be given to the person in front of the doctor for their partner. And this was a breakthrough in terms of the person who's getting the drug wasn't seen by the doctor. And there was no prescription. It was non-patient specific. It must have taken us 18 months to break through in terms of established policy. I think a situation like this is going to allow for a necessary breakthrough and funding uh, from where we're, we're scattered. I hope so, yeah. One of the things you mentioned, Dr. Moline, was in regard to the, um, the face masks. And we're now going to have a requirement with uh, I guess the governor is saying we're going to ask each of the local uh, police to nudge folks if they're out in public uh, too close to one another, uh, where's your mask? And I think, obviously, from some of the questions uh, I've seen the last day or two, members of the public will be saying that to people in a store, like, I'm here buying groceries, why don't you have a mask? But what, what is it that people can do short of finding masks online? Sometimes I'm told they're just not there or that they're maybe not very effective. 
Well, the cloth masks in general are not particularly effective, but that's what we're left with. Um, you know, I've been, I, I live in Manhattan and going on the streets of Manhattan to look and see, and I'd say about half the folks have some type of preformed mask. I don't know how they got it, or maybe a paint mask or whatever it is, and usually a, a, what we call a respirator or an N95 or, or something along those lines. And about half of them have a cloth mask or something along those lines. I, I think the value of the cloth mask is that for those people who are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic or pre-symptomatic, um, it will prevent them from popping into um, many of the particles will get caught by the mask. Um, and it will also um, hopefully enforce the need for social distancing. So I think it's not only can you not touch your face, but it also is a reminder that you need to be really judicious in protecting yourself and in washing your hands when you get back in. So these are all measures to take going forward. You know, one of my uh, friends was talking about how she went to the uh, supermarket the other day and she wore gloves and was masked up and then she she saw a, a gentleman who who had a mask who had it around his neck and was coughing and then just holding on to the, the cart so that's a way that the disease can be spread if so if he for some reason if his cough was actually due to COVID here he is coughing without the mask which he had around his neck he's coughing and then putting his hand putting his hand in front of his mouth and then putting his hands on the grocery cart. The next person who comes to get the grocery cart could easily be infected by grabbing the handle. So that's why the hand washing is critical. If you go out, you might want to consider gloves if you're going to have to touch metal poles or plastic because we know that the virus can persist for a while. I, I think that the masks are not a bad idea, mostly because they raise public awareness, but this is something we need to take seriously from an absolute, is it going to prevent viral spread as much as we hope they would? They don't, and, and we know that. Is it better than nothing? Absolutely. Do we have enough information to know how long the virus lasts in different surfaces? I must have seen 20 different articles that have 15 different uh, conclusions and have, yeah, but there's been you know there's been work for um, and you're also seeing the, the differences in how far the viral particles go is it six feet is it 27 feet um, when someone coughs or sneezes and, and is it really is six feet enough in terms of the social distancing and a lot of that is based on droplet nuclei or, or droplet uh, particles thinking that the virus is part of a droplet and it can only go so far and then it falls to the ground rather than aerosol, which would go much further and can persist in the air. I think the studies are becoming a little clearer that it's about two to three days on metal and plastic, and it's about 24 hours on paper and cardboard. So in terms of how long it can last, in terms of how long it can stay in the air, I've seen varying amounts of hours to days in terms of the viral particles, but again, it may be at a very, a more of a diluted amount. So I think really we need to think about um, the fact that just because you're isolated, um, you have to think about what you might be touching if you're going out in public and protect yourself that way with hand sanitizer or really vigilant hand washing and hand washing is, is obviously the best way to go and don't forget your thumbs. People tend to wash their hands and they forget to wash their thumbs, which is where you grab things. So um, hopefully you'll do that and sing your happy birthday song or whatever, I will survive or what other 20 second song you can think of. Dr. Moskowitz, let me switch a little bit and talk about the healthcare workers themselves, the nurses, the, 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 the your, your fellow um, perfusionists, um, people who are working with, on, on the ventilators. What's happening to them? What's happening to them as they work and they have to face terrible conditions? They have to face more deaths than they probably have seen in a whole year in their prior lives. Um, what are we going to need to do? because they're very essential for our continuing our whole health system. 
And we're also going to have to learn how to get more people uh, to be uh, in the health system because we simply don't have enough. Even before this, it was a very healthy debate whether we had enough people in the hospitals uh, to do the work that was required. Um, so I'm worried about what's, what's their state of mind uh, as they've gone through the, the surge. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a complicated question, you know. So on many hands, we were operating at near full capacity before this started, right? There's some really good reports out there through ASEP, the American College of Emergency Physicians, that talks about the state of emergency care in this country. It's probably five or ten years old now, but it gives like a state-by-state -state guide talking about what's the surge capacity, what's the operating capacity. So I kind of mentioned earlier, we were probably operating at 90 to 100 percent capacity before COVID. When COVID hit, how do you expand up from there? From a business model at the hotel, you want 100% of your beds occupied all the time to make money. And unfortunately, that was pushed upon people so much. In New York alone, we've seen a ton of hospital closures, right? We saw St. Vincent's in Manhattan closed, St. John's in Queens, Mary Magdalene in Queens, and the list goes on and on. So spaces that are premium. The patients don't go away, but there's still lack of beds. And so here we are trying to make do. Now take this disease, and this disease it was present before we realized it and knocked out a bunch of our staff before we realized it. And, you know, we were fortunate here at Jacoby that none of our staff have been too, too sick that I'm aware of. Um, we all have friends and brothers and relatives at other hospitals that were critically ill and, and many have passed away, unfortunately. Um, so it's really taking a, a, a big toll on all of us over here. Um, most of our workforce has been sick, has come back now, which is good news and a little refreshing to some of our staff, but the morale is really challenging. You know, there are a lot of deaths. Um, on a normal month in the ED, we may only have 15 to 30 deaths. We're seeing upwards of five or ten a day sometimes here, which is a tremendous increase. You know, we're finding more certificates here than I care to admit. It's, it's not reasonable or rational. This disease is, is ravishing society in, in more ways than I can pronounce, and Cuomo's numbers very well grab that attention. Um, with all this going on, it, it is challenging. Um, the ventilators, there's a lot of confusion over whether or not this virus can spread when we're doing these invasive procedures. What is aerosolization? What is droplet? What are all these things here? I apologize again, um, but what is the amount of, you know, spread, and how do we do that? And do our filters capture the virus? So we have special filters we're trying to put on all the tubing, but do we have enough filters? And that's part of the challenge. You know, public health, as Anthony kind of mentioned, was it's not a sexy thing that people want to invest in because they don't see the value because they don't understand how important it is. And it's so important because when it works, you don't see the problem. You know, so when you're spending money on public health, everyone's like, why am I spending money on this? It's because you don't see the problem. It's, it's gone away. It didn't happen. And that's the success of public health, is you don't notice the issue um, when it does its job. And so we have a lot of staff coming in from around the world to help. I'm very worried when they go back to their home state, will there be a spread of this disease when they go back? I'm hoping they quarantine. I'm hoping they do all their safety measures. But this disease is so slippery and so vicious, it wouldn't surprise me if this sneaks back with somebody on the way. And so I'm really worried when New York resumes life again, and you relax, what's going to happen to the next state that they spread? What uh, kind of taking off from there, but what, what should the family of, of, of a nurse do when uh, he comes home, she comes home at night after a 12-hour shift? Um, do they uh, interact with him? Do they, do they make sure all the clothes are washed? Uh, do they stay in a separate room? I mean, there's all sorts of questions that I think people have all sorts of opinions on it. And a lot of it's very opinion-based, unfortunately, at this moment in time, because the science is still not out there, right? So, you know, I can tell you what I do. I, I change my clothes when I get here, where once that are clothes here that I change before I go home, so I don't transfer it when I travel, and I wash this as soon as I can. Um, you know, there are many couples out there. Um, there you hear stories about families going to hotels to stay away from their families. You hear stories about divorced couples preventing their ex-spouses from seeing their kids, which is also very traumatizing to the families who want to go home and recuperate. Um, I personally haven't seen my parents in a while because I want to stay away from them just in case because they're high risk and I don't want to take any chances on that. A lot of it's being anecdotal and, and, and questionable. You know, the safest thing you can do is to really stay away from large crowds, stay away from individuals because it spreads so easy. As Dr. Malin was kind of mentioning, it goes down the street so well. You know, I'm surprised when I walk down the street sometimes seeing these crowds of people still going through and really trying to avoid that. Um, this disease, once again, is, is super, super infectious and, and super mean and just really, it just thrives on our population I've never seen before. I have a question. I have a question for many of our um, 
our physicians and, and other healthcare workers, the nurses, and, and actually anyone who's working in the hospital, is to do as Dr. Moskowitz is, is talking about is to change or to strip down as soon as they get home and go straight into the shower before there's any interaction with the family so that they come home and they're clean and they're there's, they don't bring their shoes into the house because there's a concern that there may be contamination on the bottom of their shoes unless they're wearing shoe covers, but even there, leave them outside. Um, and minimize any opportunity, take a shower, wash your hair, get rid of uh, any opportunity for there to be contamination in the household. It is a challenge and, and you know, I think that's probably the safest way to go. Other people are just staying in basements or hotels. A lot of a lot of um, healthcare facilities are um, putting folks up in, in hotels if there's concerns if someone at home is um, immunocompromised or or they have concerns um, above and beyond um, about bringing the virus home. Um, to allow them to stay away, but there are also those risks of not having that family support and not being able to interact with the people who can bring people joy and relief and take them away from a lot of what they're seeing in the course of the day. So it is, we don't have a lot of, um, there isn't information out there yet on exactly what we should do, but I think most people are recommending to do it as, Take your clothes off, shower up before you interact with anyone in the household. One of the challenges we're going to have is how do we change the healthcare system? Because we all, no one's going to be happy with what we've done. And I'm not now addressing public health because I think that's going to be really require a new foundation. But I'm thinking of a lot of the use of uh, telehealth that has come about of necessity. Um, in the past month. In fact, I, I heard a number um, about um, uh, Northwell is, went from a couple of hundred doctors using telehealth to over a thousand uh, at the current moment. And it occurs to me that this might start to change the number of people coming to an ER, the number of people who might need follow-up from a specialist um, and don't and, and it would cut out their having to travel. Or it might also mean how we deliver health care um, to the underserved areas where they, they need more and they might even be hesitant to go to institutions, but perhaps if, if there is a setting that is trustworthy, um, they might be able to be seen through telehealth. I don't know. I throw it out to each of you. Uh, Dr. Santella, maybe you could start off and then we'll go around. Sorry, I was... Um, muted. Um, you know, I'll just say just my own personal experience before I talk about the public health impact. You know, I had a visit with my primary care doctor this week. She was a little reluctant to do the telehealth um, just because it's not, not, not anything she had ever done before. And um, we got through it. It was fine. It saved me time. It probably, I know it saved her time. And, you know, there's limitations to it, of course. Um, but I also wonder how that, that kind of model can be used in a, for public health work. So for example, you know, um, when, it, when it comes to things like contact tracing or even, you know, I know it's been done by the Nassau County Health Department with watching, you know, people with TB take their medication, um, you know, directly absorb therapy. There are public health implications for doing things using technology. And I mentioned at the end of my, my remarks that we have to think about these kind of things differently. And what I hope doesn't happen is, oh, we've gotten through 2020 and now we're on to the next thing. And so we're going back, you know, to the way things were. But if you think about needing the community's buy-in in terms of adhering to these community mitigation strategies, that's much easier said than done. You know, people are already going a little, um, you know, getting anxious and fearful just being home for the last month. Imagine now extending these measures, these control measures, even if they're relaxed a little bit, for six months, a year, and how you control people, to, you know, or get them to buy into, the, you know, how worthy these measures are and not, you know, see something like civil unrest and the worst of, of people. 
And I think that's a challenge that, you know, I'm sure the officials are speaking about behind the scenes, um, as we can only really take so much information at one time and you don't want to overwhelm people. But I hope to see more of the kind of technology applications that you're seeing with telehealth applied to the public health setting. Dr. Moskowitz? Yeah, you know, telehealth is cool. Um, it does a lot of really awesome things, but it's not necessarily the answer for a lot of these things here. You know, what society needs to do at some point is, is make a decision. What is life worth financially? What is the investment you're willing to spend on real health care resources? You know, things like 9-11, things like big bus accidents, things like these horrible mass shootings we hear in the, in the news, you know, to have capacity to treat patients like that requires a certain level of investment. And that investment must be at a certain minimal capacity. I need to be operating at 50% so that I'm available when a big incident happens to stress the 100% without being overwhelmed. And like I said before, when we're starting at 90% capacity, my ability to stretch up is really not there. So society needs to determine how much money they want to put in a health system to allow it to operate so it's available when stress happens. So you can flex faster and not later. And then number two is what is the important values? You know, there are certain things we spend a lot of money and resources on in healthcare that doesn't produce better outcomes. I don't want to chew down the rabbit hole here, but things like medical malpractice and, and, and litigation reform, you know, New York spends more money than any other state on that. That money would be better spent apparently more hospital beds or getting more ventilators to have on hand. And so we really have to decide where our priorities are going forward using our available laws and regulations to prepare us for the next step. Dr. Malaya? You know, I think um, we've converted our World Trade Center program to total telehealth right now. Um, we don't really want our patients who, many of whom have respiratory diseases, coming in to see us unless there's uh, an acute um, problem where they need to be uh, seen. But just for the monitoring example, well, we can do that down the road when it's down. I think one of the biggest changes that we have found is that this has allowed there to be reimbursement for telehealth, um, which was not allowed by Medicare and then the other insurers. So the time that a doctor would spend with a patient on the phone or in a video uh, encounter, unless it was telepsychiatry or some of the other areas, was not um, was just adding additional workload as opposed to being able to be a substitute. So I think that there probably will be some um, more widespread use of telehealth going forward. I think some people do like it. For example, the checkup to if someone needs a, a refill of birth control, do you really need to go back to the doctor to see them? Or they can you do a brief telehealth visit, see if there's a way you can get your blood pressure checked or whatever it might be and then just give the prescription um, after a brief encounter like that. I think because there will be a movement to continue the telehealth um, and then, or maybe it'll be every other visit is in person and the others will be a check-in via video camera and or telephone to see how people are doing, um, which would be probably more convenient for a lot of people and might increase compliance um, for folks who have challenges getting in to um, to see the doctors. You know, for some specialties, it doesn't matter. I was supposed to see an orthopedic surgeon this morning and they called and they said, do you want to do it by telehealth? And I said, no, because this what I need is for him to manipulate my ankle that was um, injured. And so I knew that that would not be a value. I can talk about my symptoms, but really what I need is for him to assess the progress I'm making. So some things are not amenable to telehealth, um, but others can be in going forward. Or you can do a larger portion of it by telehealth and then just come in for a briefer exam going forward. Um, yeah, as someone with two fake hips, I know that. <clears throat> you, um, I wanted to kind of round up the end of this with a final thoughts from everybody, but someone just threw in a question on the chat that I thought might uh, we we might address best suggestions for healthcare workers who've been exposed to the virus no symptoms should they quarantine themselves before they go to their regular routine i presume by regular routine means by work and by home so there are recommendations that have come out 
um, and they've been varying. Initially, it was 14 days, and now it's seven days. Um, the recommendations are for healthcare workers, and I think this was in part because there was concern about if it was too stringent, then there wouldn't be enough healthcare workers, and there were already shortages. So again, it was feasibility rather than what was the best thing, but it was everyone should be masked up to prevent possible transmission from the healthcare worker if they were in that pre-symptomatic phase, getting their temperature taken before and at the end of the shift, and being really cognizant of any symptoms that they might develop. Um, ideally, they would quarantine for 14 days. That's not the regulations, either in New York State or in, by the CDC right now. It's only seven days. And actually, question. they're allowed to continue working if they're asymptomatic and have been exposed now. Um, but yeah. for other contacts, it's still recommended that they quarantine. I'm going to give a little bit of a different opinion here in the sense of what is exposed. I'll tell you, if you're a healthcare worker, you've been exposed, period. It's impossible to not have been exposed working in a hospital right now with these patients here. The EDs are so full, the hospitals are so full, it is impossible to have been fully 100% protected. And we have no way of knowing because testing still hasn't caught up to it yet. That's the challenge. You know, there are many clinicians I'm working with who don't know. They lost smell, they lost taste a little bit, is it in their head, or are they actually symptomatic? They have no clue. The fever is not present as ubiquitous as people think it is. 99 and change, is that a fever? The forehead thermometers are lousy at detecting temperatures, which is what most of these mass screening places are doing. You see these pictures online at the airport, they have the gun to hold the head, see the forehead temperature. They don't work very well, you know? And so we are really challenged. We, we've made every person in this hospital wear a mask, just protect even before we got to the, the recommendations. We said, you know what, we just have to be extra safe and put masks on. Um, so I don't really know that answer. I don't think anyone knows that answer yet. And until we really get, um, good viral testing that's quick turnaround, that's efficient and effective, um, and, and everywhere mainstream, it's gonna be really hard to answer that. So I would say to you that I'm certain a lot of our staff have it, don't even realize they have it. We're doing our very best to protect everybody because it, it, this disease is extremely, extremely contagious. Yeah, what I was giving was actually the guidelines rather than my personal opinion there. I agree with Josh. I think that we need much more rapid testing. It would be so much more ideal to be able to have a valid test. And 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 one of the, I, I think the key points that Dr. Moskowitz raised is that people can't be, if they have a negative test and they have symptoms, they have to presume that they have COVID-19. And because again, people may require two or three tests to show that they're positive. If it smells like it, if they have all the characteristic symptoms, assume they have it and just go forward as if someone is um, infected with COVID-19. I think from in an ideal world, we would quarantine for 14 days because that's when we know the transmission should end um, for the vast majority of folks if they have, that's the incubation period. Um, I, I think that we're running into what is ideal versus what is feasible. Dr. Santella, or then final thoughts? Um, I, you know, this will change us. You know, while, while emergency preparedness is not uh, my background or my, you know, my specialty, having, you know, I worked in downtown Manhattan during, when September 11th happened. I lived in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina as a doctoral student. I have an appreciation for emergency response and preparedness because of my lived experience. And I think for good or bad, this will allow everyone, because as, as one of the other speakers mentioned earlier, this has touched everyone regardless of where you live, who you are, what your income is, what your race is. And so I hope that as we move forward and um, as, you know, resume our new normal, whatever that ends up looking like, that we don't lose sight that public health is important and needs to be changed dramatically, not next year, five years, 10 years in the future now. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Final thoughts, Dr. Mullane? I agree. I think that we need to prioritize not just prevention, but preparedness. And we need to, um, to to take the lessons that we are learning, not just in how the virus acts, 
but in how we are interacting and how what this has exposed in our society where we're realizing that we were saying that we were um, we have the best health care in the world yet if you strip away the shiny new tools we have and the tremendous innovation and the United States healthcare system has some of the most amazing innovation. But we also, if you take all those shiny new objects away and you look at where our numbers are in terms of infant mortality and just some of the most basic public health, that's all been exposed by this pandemic and uh, uh, the effects on not having healthcare access for everybody, not having, um, it's just, we're seeing the effects of um, a very um, compartmentalized um, have and have not healthcare system. And Dr. Moskowitz, if, now that you got your lights back on, that's the, uh, the advantage of the motion sensor in the office, I guess. Uh, unfortunately, I have no control over it. Um, you know, it's hard. I, I think that we, we can't take for granted this separating, isolating issue. You know, I think people, it's going to get really hard soon as the weather gets warmer for people to stay home. But it's so, so, so important. It's really the only tool we have without all our modern techniques to really prevent people from getting ill. And I, I can't stress that enough. Um, we need to start investing back in healthcare infrastructures to prevent future uh, infections because this is not the last time we'll see this virus. I don't think it'll be another 100 years like the Spanish flu so it comes around again, unfortunately. Um, I think it's going to be a soon again. So we have to figure out what is our priorities, what's important, where we're going to spend our money. Um, and it's also to make you realize we are not invincible. Despite all of modern medicine, we are not invincible. I've watched people in their 20s pass away from this disease. I've watched people in their 80s pass away from this disease. It's everyone in between. It's indiscriminate. I, I think the uh, social injustice that Dr. Santel mentioned is real. Um, I think it's so contagious they're being affected more because of living conditions. I think it's really, really hard. And I just, I can't stress enough. And I'm grateful for the outpouring support that people have provided. I'm, I'm grateful for the clapping that people do at 7 o'clock at night. It really brings tears to my eyes um, and gives us more, the morale to, to kind of move on. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for everyone's uh, kind words. So thank you. And I think that's where we're going to wrap up there. There's few questions keep popping up. We're not going to be able to answer everybody's. We'll try to address it later. Um, I wanted to thank the panelists. You have been fantastic. You have been insightful. You have been intelligent. You are leading the way in terms of the direction where we ought to be going. I want to thank every, all of the people who have been participating by listening to us. Uh, we ask uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics, uh, we'd like to do that, uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics, uh, we'd like to do that, uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics, uh, we'd like to do that, uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics, uh, we'd like to do that, uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, 
uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to 
a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics. 
Uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics, uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics, uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics, uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics, uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics, uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics, uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics, uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any thoughts you may have as to a better format, a better topic, a better more topics, uh, we'd like to do that. Uh, that any